Hey now, Brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at a game that I can only hold up the box lid for, and that is Kingdom Death Monster from Adam Poots, the designer, and Adam Poots Games, or just Kingdom Death Monster, the company. I think that's just the name of the publisher at this point. Uh, the bottom, the whole box, the bottom of the box is just full of stuff I do not want to tip over at this point, and I've been rough enough on this box as it is. Now, uh, if you're familiar with my channel at all, if you, unless you're completely new here, you know that I've been kind of obsessed with this game. This is one of the very first Kickstarters I ever backed, one of three that I backed all around the same time, right when I first got into modern board gaming, right when I first found out that the Kickstarter was a thing and just got addicted to it in the beginning. So a lot of my thoughts and feelings and how I feel about board games and Kickstarter is tied together with Kingdom Death Monster. And I remember back in those Halcyon days uh, that I was just addicted to that Kickstarter page. I there was never anything like it. I was in the comment section every single day. I was watching the numbers go up. The project ended up making over $2 million, which now, when you look at Cool Mini or Not's numbers, doesn't seem like a huge deal, although it is still a lot of money. But at the time, it was just mind-boggling. No one could believe how much money that project was making. I remember the final week or so where just every day was another stretch goal popping up and new minis was coming out. Everyone was so excited and that feeling was amazing. And that is definitely part of the reason why I still enjoy Kickstarter to this day. Now, it has been almost three years <laughs> since the project ended. To be fair, the amount of content that was unlocked for this project, no one believed the initial shipping estimate, which was November of 2013. Uh, no one actually believed that that was going to be met. So, okay. But no one quite expected that it would be this long either. Although, now that we have the box in hand, and you can watch my unboxing video on the channel if you want. Uh, maybe I'll set up some little card system over here so you can click on that. But... Now that I've seen the amount of content just in the base game, not counting any of the expansions that were unlocked as part of the campaign, I can understand why it took so long. Let's assume that you're coming fresh to this and you have no idea what I'm talking about. Kingdom Death is a hard thing to explain. Uh, Adam Poots, the designer and publisher of the game. By the way, this intro is going to be long. The whole video is going to be long. I'm sorry. You just have to bear with me. Um, Adam Poots, the designer and owner of the company, has been producing miniatures for quite a while set in this Kingdom Death world. Uh, before, they were just hobby miniatures. In fact, they were not tied to any game. They were just really fancy, high quality, very risque, dark, um, berserk, and H.R. Geiger-inspired miniatures that you could purchase through his store. And that was that. Then he decided to make this game out of the world that these miniatures were, were based on. And that, in fact, he reused some of those different miniature sculpts and characters in this world. And he's never been fully forthcoming as to what this world is supposed to be. Kingdom Death is like this, it, it could be hell, it could just be an alternate dimension, it could be just a world that has no explanation as we know it, but here's what the story is. At the beginning of Kingdom Death Monster, it's a fully cooperative game, you and the other players are called survivors. Survivors of what? Or just survivors in general? I guess, who knows? But you wake up, huddled together in a circle, with only this faint lantern light. You each have your own like magical-ish lantern that is with you. And other than that light, it is darkness as far as the eye can see. And the ground is made up of carved stone faces, just eerily eyes shut, staring st straight up into the dark abyss above you. You have nothing but a loincloth and like ceremonial makeup on your face and no memory of who you are, why you're there, you can't even really speak to each other at the beginning of the game and no idea what's going on. And then all of a sudden, a giant white lion with strange hands hurls out of the darkness and starts tearing apart the survivors, eating them, ripping them limb from limb. A few of you manage to pry apart the stone faces on the ground and take a sharp slab of stone and fight back. That is the beginning of the story. That is where the story opens up. The very first story, the first scenario of the game is you fighting this lion desperately for survival. And you might die. It's possible, okay? But assuming you survive, then the game kicks into high gear. You start a settlement where you will begin with other survivors that you stumble across and that are born in your settlement 
you will try to live in this dark hell world or whatever it might happen to be, however you want to refer to it. And how the game works, I mean, we'll go into it, but it's all about you hunting the creatures out there in the darkness, surviving their onslaughts, and perhaps even more mysterious figures that stumble upon your settlement that come from far off places in this dark world. And it's just you trying to innovate and make and build the civilization up as far as you possibly can and survive as long as you possibly can, fully cooperatively or solo. It's way more complicated than I just explained, as, even as long as that explanation was. And I cannot possibly cover everything in this overview. In fact, I wouldn't want to because a large part of the enjoyment of this game, and yes, I do enjoy this game, but I'll clarify that in my final thoughts, uh, a large part of the enjoyment is not getting spoiled on a lot of the storyline events. For uh, much of this game is storytelling in a sense and plot twists and surprises and things popping out at you. I do not want to spoil that for you because that is a huge part of the fun of the game. But I will tell you what I can just to give you a general gist of the game, show you some of the miniatures, things like that. Now, I have not completed this game, quote unquote. The game is supposed to be played over 25 lantern years, which are actually game sessions of the game. I have not done that because the game is hard. <laughs> but also, I've been playing with a group. I've been playing solo separately, trying different strategies, trying different um, innovations and ways to innovate my settlement. I believe I have gleaned enough information about the game. I've explored enough things to make a final opinion about it as to how the game works for me, how much I enjoy the game, and how much I would like to recommend it to other people. And just how much is that? Well, we'll save that for my final thoughts. Let me give you as brief an overview as I possibly can. It's still going to be long. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know what I think. All right, it's tough to know where to start uh, when explaining this game because there's so much to it. But first and foremost, there is a giant rule book, well, giant by board game standards, uh, rule book that comes with the game. This is both the rules and also uh, all of the different story events during the course of the game. I haven't gotten to this yet, but there is a, uh, a huge amount of story events that may happen, and you're going to flip through the book and refer to those specific events as they happen. I don't even want to really show you too much about them because it would be spoilers. It's kind of fun to experience them for the first time, but half of the book is a uh, rules resource, and to its credit, it actually has a, a really helpful glossary in the back of it. There's also a comic book back here, which is kind of cool, but it doesn't really mean anything for the game itself. The rest of it, all within the middle section of the book, is all the different storyline events that uh, will probably come to pass at some point, assuming that you play and survive long enough. Now, at the start of the game, you are going to get a character sheet. There's a whole pad of these sheets that come with the game, and uh, the game goes up to four players, one to four players. Actually, you can theoretically play it with five or six as a variant, but it's mainly for one to four players, and even if you play with less than four people, you still need to have four survivors, or else, uh, which are the characters in the game, or else you will never live. You'll, ne you'll never survive most battles. So even as a one-player game, you have to take control of four people, which means you would have to have four of these sheets. Although, and this is very important, this is something that people that I play the game with have the hardest time grasping when I try to explain it to them. You may be taking control of exactly four unique survivors at the start of the game, but during the course of the game, you're actually going to get many survivors. You're going to build a population, hopefully, um, of survivors in your settlement, all of which we're going to get to explaining in a little bit. But that means that you may not be using the same survivors each time. So you may actually have many of these sheets as you need to make them in order to take out different people on hunts. Because sometimes a survivor either gets killed or they have to stay in the settlement for some reason related to a story event. Whatever it might be, in which case you're going to need to have a new survivor ready to go to go out into the field. So let's take a little uh, closer look at this and what it means. You have your name, uh, male and female. Now just for naming your character at the beginning of the game, you're going to gain one survival point, which you're going to mark off here. Survival points 
if you've played Dungeons and Dragons, they're kind of like action points. They're going to enable you to do amazing things upwards and above of what you're normally capable of, and they can really save your life in a pinch. At the start of the game, you are only going to have access to the dodge ability, which can prevent you from being hit when you spend your survival point. Uh, but then you may eventually you'll be able to get these other abilities as well, which could be things like Encourage, which lets someone else stand up, or Surge, which gets you an extra action, and so on. Now, uh, the whole group has a survival limit, which is to say there's only so much survival that you can actually have at a time, although you can spend as much of that as you want. But your survival limit will uh, continue to rise during the course of the Lantern years of the game. All right, now here are the base stats for survivors. You always start off with five movement, which is how many squares you can move. Accuracy is how likely you are to potentially hit a target, the number that you have to meet. Um, so that number might be six, in which case you have to roll a six or higher. Now this is going to change from hunt to hunt based on which gear you have. This is just a way for you to keep track of it. Strength is how likely you are to actually wound a monster once you have actually hit him. So you have to hit him and then wound him. Evasion is your ability, as it may imply, to actually evade wounds. Uh, luck is how likely you are to do a critical hit. Now, luck is like the hardest stat to possibly increase. Usually, you have to roll a natural 10 on the dice in order to do a critical hit. If you actually have a plus one luck bonus, then you would have a 9 or 10 threat range for a crit. But that can, again, it's very hard to get that to go up. Then you have speed, which is how many dice you get to roll when you're making an attack. So it could be 2 or 3, whatever it might be. And every potential, every die that comes up with a correct uh, number for accuracy is going to be a potential hit. Up next are all the different parts of the body, including the brain, which is kept off to itself because it's a little bit different than all of the others. But you have head, arms, body, waist, and legs. All these different areas can be potentially protected by gear that you're going to gain during the course of the game. And you'll keep track of what your armor rating is depending on what that gear is also during the course of the game. And whenever you take damage, you get to eliminate your armor rating from whatever damage is incoming. If any of it gets through, however, then you have to start marking off boxes on your grid. Now, for everything except for the head, there's actually, in, uh, in the brain, I'll get back to that in a second, there are two boxes. The light-colored box, if you get hit there, well, it sucks, but nothing bad's going to happen to you. If your dark-colored box gets filled in, however, you get knocked down to the ground. The wind's knocked out of you, and you have to take an action just to stand back up next time. However... If you take damage on a part of your body, and notice that the head only has a dark box, uh, because the head injury is bad, <laughs> but if you take damage and both of those boxes are already filled up, then you take a severe injury. And in the rule book, there is a severe injury table for each different part of the body that you have to roll on, and it's never good. And some lucky circumstances, you'll be okay, but you might be bleeding, and there's like an incredibly rare chance it'll give you uh, just a second wind. But in most cases, you're probably going to die or be close to death from taking a severe injury. So you don't want that to happen. Now, brain is a little bit weirder than the other ones. Taking brain damage can also be really bad, and you can potentially die from that as well if you take a serious injury. Notice that there is a wound box. However, during the course of the game, you may actually gain insanity. Insanity is a stat sort of like armor that you can gain, and this is a hard thing for people to understand, but... Just like armor, insanity protects your brain. It's not necessarily a bad thing. In some rare circumstances, it can be a bad thing to be too insane. But when you reach a certain threshold of insanity, you will become officially insane. That will kick off some special story effects. But in the meantime, regardless of that, insanity is, go is going to protect your brain like a blade of coating. It's a weird thing to understand, you know, like most HP Lovecraft games, you wouldn't want to be insane. That's a bad thing. But in this game, kind of helps. Uh, down here in the bottom corner, you can keep track of fighting arts, which are special um, attacks you'll gain during the course of the game. Disorders, abilities, and impairments, which are all exactly like what they sound like. Now up here is pretty interesting. You have different types of general stats. You have hunt experience, weapon proficiencies, courage, and understanding. Now these things are, you'll gain hunt XP for actually going out on hunts, obviously, enough. Weapon proficiencies is going to come with time. I don't want to get in too much into that because it's kind of spoilers. Same thing with courage and understanding. You don't, you're not going to gain those automatically, but some story events will enable you to gain those and fill in the boxes. And then when you get certain courage and understanding levels, you're actually going to be able to get special abilities related to them. Now, for all of these different things, notice that there are dark colored boxes on these charts. What that means is that when you get, uh, you'll start from going from left to right filling in the boxes. 
as soon as you fill in a colored box, uh, and these aren't like the wounds, so just keep that separate, but as soon as you fill in a colored box, you're eligible for a certain story event depending on what the stat is. So for instance, if you get the first colored box in the hunt XP, you have an age event. So you're going to go to the age event in the story, in the rule book, and look at what the level one event is. And notice that it'll keep going up and up and up. And eventually, you are not, you're going to have to retire. You get too old to go out on hunts because the game takes place over 25 lantern years, which is either 25 real years or even longer than that. And courage and understanding have their own particular events related to them as well, which you will unlock as time goes on. So that's just a general rundown of your character sheet. Now, everyone also starts off with an item grid. Uh, this is where you're going to be keeping all of the equipment and goods that you have during the course of the game. Everyone starts off with a cloth and a founding stone. So let's take a closer look at those. The cloth, notice that there's a tiny little symbol next to the armor rating for that. That tells you which part of the body, in this case the waist, uh, that is going to protect. And this is just, uh, this one says you gain one armor power at that hit location. So it's just very, very basic. That's all that it does. Now the founding stone. Here you have the weapon stats up in the top corner. You have uh, the weapon speed, which is the top number. That's how many dice you get to roll. The accuracy, which means you have to roll a seven or higher on those dice in order to hit. And you have the strength, which is you get to add a plus one bonus to your strength roll to see if you can actually wound the creature. Founding stones also have a special effect, which is that you can just choose to uh, banish the card back to the box. It's called archiving in this game. Permanent get rid of it uh, in order to throw it and automatically deal a critical wound. So at the beginning of the game, that could be the difference between life and death, but normally you would just use it like a dagger. Over here to the side, it's just a reminder of what the survivors can do on their turn. Every turn you get an activation and a movement. An activation is, again, use D&D terms, a standard action that you get to do. And then there's the different types of survival actions you get for spending survival if you're eligible to use those actions during the course of the game. Also, no matter what, if you get rid of, if you have no other weapons, you can always use Fist and Tooth, and there are the stats for that as a last resort. Now, the thing about the item grid that I want to talk about right now is that this is not like locations of your body. These can be constantly fluid and moving around. And that's actually very important for some of the later bits of items that you can get because uh, there is a, such a thing in this game as affinity. It's kind of like a little mini puzzle game. Uh, a lot of the more advanced items have little colored bars on the sides of the cards. If you're able to link them up properly, you can actually get bonuses uh, when it applies. So some items, for instance, the scrap sword here or the monster tooth necklace require a certain amount of colored affinities, completed colored boxes in order to activate those effects and get the most use out of them. And just to give you, just uh, show you some of the, these are some of the more advanced items that you'll craft during the game. A lot of the items in the game require you to actually build them from resources that you find from monsters. So you have Monster Grease, which gives you plus one evasion, but if you have three green affinities, three completed green squares in your grid, you get another plus one evasion. Uh, then you have a Leather Skirt, which gives you three armor. It has a green infinite affinity box for it. It's hard to say affinity as opposed to infinity. The Monster Tooth Necklace always gives you plus one strength, but if you have two red affinities, you might get plus, another plus one strength. The Scrap Sword has this uh, deadly ability, and on a perfect hit, the uh, edge sharpens and you get plus four strength for the rest of the attack and rawhide boots. And that is just really a very small sampling of the number of items that you may get during the course of the game. I don't even want to spoil most of them for you, but there's a ton of stuff. And before we stop focusing on the characters, I'll go ahead and show you the survival, survivor miniatures. These were actually painted by a friend of mine, so these are not what your miniatures were necessarily going to look like. Uh, but they have, notice the skull, uh, the stone face bases. And there are two males and two females. So everyone's going to have one of these survivors that they're going to use during the uh, showdown phase and the hunt phase of the game. They will be stand-ins for whatever survivors you want them to be. And also you can build other units and have different types of items and gear representing what's actually on your character. It's a pretty intense game. Okay, now let me explain the basic premise of what a game session is going to be like in Kingdom Death Monster. Every session of the game is supposed to be a lantern year. Now in game terms, a lantern year is three phases of the game played one after the other in a specific order. When you finish all three phases, that is a game session which could be any length of time. 
So the first one is the hunt phase. The hunt phase is where you have picked a quarry, you the group of survivors, and now you are hunting it down in order to, number one, feed your settlement, and number two, get resources that you're going to be able to use back in the settlement to build stuff, to build locations, to build specific gear and items and stuff that you uh, need in order to get better and to level up your characters. Once you get done with the hunt phase, then it goes down to the showdown phase. This is where you found your quarry, and now you have to fight it and kill it. Once you get done with that, you drag its carcass and what's left of it back to the settlement. And then you have the settlement phases, which is where you do all of these different innovations. So here I have the setup for the hunt board. And this board is actually double-sided. It's not really a board per se. It's actually a cardboard. On the other side of here is actually the settlement track. But we're just going to show you the hunt side for now. The survivors are going to start off in the start space. It actually says start on it at the head of this board. Uh, the monster in question, which in this case is the white lion. This is the very first thing that you're going to face during the first story of the game. And then it's the only quarry you'll have for your first lantern year. But other quarries, which I will not show you. I'll let those be a surprise for you. And you can see pictures of them on the internet. But uh, those you'll have to fight as well. But this is also, by the way, painted just like my survivors by my friend. So yours will not look quite like that. Notice that it has human hands. I don't know if that's really evident, but that's a, a weird thing about it. And ah, oh, what the heck? I'm going to show you anyways. I don't care. I mean, here's a, one of the other ones unpainted. This is a screaming antelope, which is another type of quarry you might come across during the course of the game. And rock -a boom The phoenix, which is also a super nasty quarry you might eventually have to face. And, and notice that it has... Let me see. I, I, this is worth showing because it's super creepy. There is a human face inside of its mouth. <laughs> okay, so those are quarries that you might have to face. Yes, I know, it's hard to believe that that last thing was a quarry, but regardless of which one you choose, um, first and foremost, aside from just choosing which quarry you have, you choose its level. It gets stronger and therefore gives better gear And when you choose to do a higher level, but then again, it might kill you and you might not survive, so something to keep in mind. If it starts off on this side of the overwhelming darkness uh, section, which is a story event, if you if your survivors get to that point, and very bad one at that, uh, <laughs> then it's a level one. But if it goes further down the track, it'll be a level two and potentially a level three as well. Uh, and you don't ever want to get to the starvation uh, parts of the board uh, if you're just unable to find your quarry. Now, all of these other sections here will be filled up with hunt cards if you choose to go that far out and find one of the level twos or level three quarries. But for now, we're just going to do a level one. You will put a certain amount of specific hunt cards particular to the lion. Notice that it has the lion, uh, the white lion card a name and symbol on the back. That's his hunt cards. Um, every quarry has their own set of hunt cards. Then you have the generic hunt cards. The generic hunt cards actually just have on this side a, uh, a percentile chance roll, and then you'll take a random uh, hunt event from the rule book that you have to read and endure. But really, the white line events are the same way. So for instance, uh, I don't want to show you too many of these because again, spoilers, it's kind of fun to experience them for your own. But I just want to show you what would happen. So what you'll do, the line starts there. You will decide to move your events, your survivors to the first card. And this one says, Sea of Golden Grass. Fields of golden grass lay ahead. The event revealer may choose to avoid the planes and roll twice on the hunt event table before moving on the hunt board. Otherwise, each survivor gains plus one courage and the event revealer rolls on the table below. Now, this game comes with quite a few D10 dice. That is the main type of die that you're going to use during the course of the game. The 10 is a lantern. Sorry, that's not really showing up very well. But here's a little lantern symbol. So you'll roll to see where is it? Okay, so it's an eight, which means looking at the little hunt card here for an eight, it is, well, I'll just read it like this. It's really small text, sorry. <laughs> it is, you pick up the trail, choose to move the white line one space forward or backward on the hunt event board. So if you're really masochist, you can move the lion back with that event, but more likely you want to move him forward. Now the lion does not start off with a card where he is, and if he is on a card, it's irrelevant, meaning that if our, if our survivors get through this event and make it to him and make it onto that space without him moving beforehand, the, the showdown happens immediately. You ignore the other event card that is there. Now, interestingly enough, by doing that, you've ambushed the lion. 
if it was the other way around, if the lion had moved onto you because of the hunt event cards, he would ambush you. Something to keep in mind for sure. In any case, now time for the showdown. All right, so this is basically what the showdown board will look like when you're ready for the showdown. Now, the limitations of my camera means that I've compressed things quite a bit, and just for the sake of uh, expediation, which is a word I just made up, I think, um, <laughs> the survivors are not quite in the right positions. And I've just got a stack of resource cards sitting out over there, but this is generally what it will look like. It is worth noting the detail on the artwork of the board, but the white line in this scenario is going to start in the center of the showdown board. What you're going to do is look in the book for the particular type of uh, quarry that you're fighting. Um, what, along with all the other story events, there's actually showdown events, which will tell you exactly how to set up the board. Some of the quarry showdowns are going to start off with different types of terrain. So it might be a, a dead monster, or it might be um, these acanthus plants, uh, which are growing out of the stone faces on the ground, whatever it might be, and they'll have special terrain cards with them detailing their special rules and how the survivors in the monster can interact with them. So there's lots of different things that could potentially happen uh, depending on which quarry and or whatever, or nemesis, well, okay, that's giving away a little bit much, but <laughs> whatever you're fighting, there'll be special rules for it. Uh, now, over here to the side, you are going to have... Uh, there's a separate board, like another thin cardboard board, which will keep track of all of the different monster stuff. So this section of the board keeps track of his mood cards. There are mood cards that the uh, monster may have that will stay in play. Persistent injuries. There are tokens that you'll keep track of. Um, different injuries like minus one to speed or minus one to uh, uh, attacks or evasion, whatever it might be. Here you have his basic action card. Now, on one side of this, it has his basic action, which is just like a claw attack and uh, how he picks his target. So his basic way to pick his target is to close the survivor in field of view if he has to resort to his basic attack. On the other side, it will tell you how to set up his AI deck. The main way that this white lion is going to interact with you, and by interact, I mean eviscerate you, is through his AI deck. It also has his special ability Sniff, which is what he does when he can't do anything else. If he can't find targets applicable for his attacks that turn, he sniffs and therefore can find by scent everyone on the board for his next action. But then over here, you have the, uh, with the light in the way, you have the AI deck and the hit location deck, the two most important parts of every monster. Every monster has their own AI deck and their own hit location deck, which is basically going to dictate how the monster behaves. So, for instance, I'm uh, just going to do this real quick. If it was a monster's turn, the first thing that he would do is flip over one of his AI cards and that would show him what he is supposed to do on his turn, how he is going to, again, quote-unquote, interact with the survivors so this one says grasp so this he's going to try to grasp his target he'll pick a target it'll have a set of circumstances that he is going to try to fight so this one says sorry about that uh it says closest knockdown survivor in range if that doesn't apply then closest survivor in range if that doesn't apply then he sniffs then he will move and attack and sometimes he'll have different special abilities and things like that. And if he's able to grab you, that could be even worse, and so on. He has the same type of stats as the survivors have. He'll have um, how many dice he gets to roll with his speed, what his accuracy is, what he needs to hit, which is usually much better than the survivors, and how much damage he'll deal to your particular uh, point of body. Now, here's where I'll show you the other type of die that is in the game. Whenever survivors are, are hit by the monsters, you depending on how many um, areas are hit at once, you will have these loca hit location die. These are D6s that have all the different symbols for the different sections of your body where you might be hit. There's actually, since there's six sides, there are two for body because obviously body is most likely to get hit. So two of the sides of the dice are the body section. You'll roll those when you're hit and see where you have to mark off boxes on the character sheet that I showed you earlier. But going back for a minute, uh, when the monster is dealt damage, well, his hit points are kept track of through his AI deck. So when uh, an AI card, AI card is used and just uh, by the monster and then just goes away, it goes into his discard pile. But when the survivors are able to successfully wound the monster, the AI cards are going to get stuck into the wound stack, which is going to put him closer to death. If the survivors are able to, and by the way, this is nowhere near as fat as that deck should be. I just put them all in the pile there. That deck should be much slimmer depending on 
what level of lion you're actually facing. But every time that you deal a successful wound to the lion, you get rid of this one of one of his AI cards. When all of his AI cards are gone, including the ones that have been discarded during the course of the game, if you hit him again, he is dead. That's the end of the showdown phase. And once all of his AI cards are gone, before you deal that final blow, he's stuck with his basic attack. Now, every time that the survivors potentially, I say potentially hit, meaning that they rolled dice for their attacks and it hit uh, the accuracy needed to hit with that weapon, then you're going to flip over however many potential um, attacks you dealt uh, from his hit location deck. Every monster has a hit location deck. So let's say I had two potential hits, which means I may hit the beast's ear in the beast's chest. So instead of dice, the way they were used for the survivors to determine where uh, the hits are, the monsters have a hit location deck. Um, but just because you flipped over these cards means nothing. Now you have to try to hit to wound. So you've got potential hits. Now you have to roll dice to see, add your strength to the totals of these dice and see if it is enough to actually wound uh, this monster, which again, you have to look at the lion stats and see what it takes to wound him. If you're successful, then you get rid of one of his AI cards and boom, the hit location card goes into the hit location discard pile. Sometimes it'll say failure, which means if you fail, something really bad is going to happen. Like he's going to hit you back or he'll move away or he might even heal, things like that. Below this line, notice that there is a picture of a die with a lantern. If you roll a natural 10 on your wound attack, not the to hit roll, just the wound roll, then you deal a critical wound, which can be really, really bad for the monster. Could be a persistent injury, you rip off his jaw, something like that. It may actually affect his later attacks. Some cards will actually say, if the lion has blank persistent injury, this one specific, specific type of injury, then this card behaves in a different way. So it can be very, very cool to get those uh, critical hits. But on, in almost all cases, you need a natural 10 to do it. And a natural 1 is always a failure. Now, that was a lot of information all at once, so just to, to bring it back to reality for a bit, how it'll work depending on whether who ambushed who, the survivors or the lion's going to go. If the survivors are going first, then you can go in any order you want, and you can change it from round to round. So this turn, you can say this survivor, the blonde-haired guy, goes first, uh, but then the blue-haired girl's going to go, and so on. However it is strategically advantaged, advantageous for you to do it, you can do it, and you can change it next round. You are not really bound by anything. You get one movement and one activation. You can take those in any order. You can move first, then activate, or vice versa. Um, you can use whatever equipment you have available to you. You will, let's say that, uh, this is, I actually named this character Mia. Uh, she'll, after a character from Lunar, but because uh, she also had blue hair. Uh, she's going to move up, and she's going to try to attack with her Founding Stone. So let's just say she gets two accuracy, I believe it is. Then she'll roll her two dice. She's got two eights. That means it's two potential hits. I'll flip over two hit location cards, and then I'll try to wound. That's the general gist of what you're mostly going to do, depending on your weapon, during the course of the game. Now, when is the monster's turn? Here's the interesting bit. One player must be designated the monster controller every round, and that's going to pass clockwise every round of play. Uh, the monster controller just does all the bookkeeping for the monster, like flipping the AI card, doing what it says, and so on. But also has to make decisions if there's more than one eligible target. If there is more than one eligible target, and that player survivor that they have control of is one of those targets, if they target their own survivor, that survivor gains plus one insanity. It's just a bonus that they get during the game. That is pretty cool artwork. I'll focus in on that. And again, insanity is good. I know that's counterintuitive. but <laughs> So again, once that it's over, you dealt the killing blow to the monster, get rid of his AI deck, it's over, and you will get a bunch of resources depending on the type of monster that it is. And there's basic resources and there's specific resources, a specific resource deck for each type of creature. So it could be things like a great cat bone, or you have a... Uh, white fur, or you have the curious hands, the strange hand that he has, uh, so so on and so forth. And you can fight the same quarry over and over and over again. Now, and, and up different levels. Now, let's get to that settlement phase. So lastly, we have the settlement phase. This is the last thing you should do during a session of Kingdom Death, whether you're going to pack it in or do another one afterwards. That's entirely up to you. And you'll have to forgive me because this is the most complicated part of the game. Not really, well, it's got the most bookkeeping involved. So I'm going to try to race through this just to give you a taste. 
Also, there's quite a few things in this section that I don't want to show you because it would be major spoilers. So, something to keep in mind. The first thing is, when you have made your first settlement after the first story, what, much like with a character sheet, you'll have a sheet just for your uh, new settlement. You'll name it, you will have a survival limit, uh, you'll have a timeline. Every time that you do this whole three phases, you'll click off a lantern year. And these will also tell you when you have specific story events that you need to go through by flipping back through the book. You'll keep track of the number of deaths that occur during the course of the game, uh, milestone story events when certain triggers are met. Uh, there are such a thing as nemesis monsters who are not quarries per se, but are really, really bad. Uh, <laughs> the different settlement locations that you may unlock, I'll talk about that in a second. Here's the different types of quarries. Notice that the white lion you always start off with, then the screaming antelope, then the phoenix, and of course there's room for more. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, different principles and innovations. I'll explain those in a minute, but those are the different ways that your uh, place can upgrade. And Oh, let me rip this off. On the other side is just more stat keeping. So there's your storage, items that you are holding on to from game to game that you haven't used quite yet, the number of monsters you've defeated, and here's your population. You'll gain quite a bit of population during the course of the game, and you'll actually keep track of them. Uh, and there's <laughs> lost settlements, which is very disheartening. Uh, but you'll keep track of all of the different people in your settlement and their gender. Now, that's what I was mentioning before, is that you'll have a, a lot of population, and all of them are potential people to take out on hunts if you have to. But okay, there's that. So when you get back to the, uh, the settlement after a hunt, you'll flip over the, or after uh, the showdown, you'll flip over the hunt board and just do what it says in order. So the first thing is you are going to set up the settlement with all the different areas, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, then the survivors return. Now, the, any survivor that is returning from a showdown is called a returning survivor, and they will be eligible for certain benefits depending on the events that are happening. First of those is endeavors. There, anytime you see a little star symbol, that's an endeavor. Returning survivors each get one endeavor to spend during the course of the settlement phase. Those endeavors are going to be used for innovation, story events, and so on. Then you go to the uh, draw the settlement event. There is always going to be a settlement event that occurs from this big stack of settlement cards. I debated this. I'm not going to show you any of them. Not even one because I just don't want to ruin anything for you. I'm sorry. But it's like a random amount of stuff that can happen. It'll be like a random table that you can roll on or just someone visits the settlement. Whatever it might be. But I just don't want to spoil it for you. I think that's a lot of the fun of the game. You will update the death count, which could also trigger a milestone. You will tick off a uh, lantern year on the timeline, which must also kick off a storyline event. And then you will develop. This is where you're actually going to innovate, make places, and so on. So let's jump right into that. So at the start of the game, you start off with the lantern horde. And the lantern horde uh, will remind you of how you can innovate and also the different types of buildings you can start off with right at the start. So let's assume that all four of your survivors survive. You will have four innovation points and you can use those right away to build these different areas which uh, are not going to require any kind of prerequisites. You can make a bone smith, a skinnery, and an organ grinder which are going to let you make different types of items. I didn't necessarily set all of those out here but uh, for instance, here is the bone smith, and here are all the different items that you can craft. And of course, they're made of bone, a <laughs> bone dagger, bone blade, so on and so forth. Over here, it will tell you, and remember, those are exactly the types of cards that you may gain uh, from killing monsters. Um, so you have the different types of prerequisites, like you need one bone to make a bone dagger, and so on. Anytime you see one of these brown boxes, that means that that is locked until you meet certain innovations, like you need ammonia in order to make a bone pickaxe. Down at the bottom, it will tell you another type of building that you can potentially make if you meet the prerequisites. So you can make a weapons crafter if you can get a three bone in a hide and spend an innovation. One of the locations, I don't have it out here right now, the organ grinder actually lets you it's kind of weird to say it, but force intimacy and potentially raise the population of your settlement because some of the locations will actually have special abilities on them that the players can interact with. Now, another thing you can do during the course of the game is make innovations. These are like uh, things that your survivors have learned to do as they have continued to grow and thrive as a population. So, for instance, let me see if I can find it quickly. 
you. That's not there. Sorry. You. One of the first innovations, the very first innovation you will start off with is language, which is going to uh, give you all the ability to communicate, uh, which is very important, and give you the encourage ability, but it will also unlock things. Every time that you make a new innovation, it will tell you to add cards into the innovation deck of potential. So that one lets you add like paint, and uh, different types of other things re regarding um, that are, have to do with language, that have to do with the beginning steps of your population. Those will be shuffled into the starts of your innovation deck. And as you make get more innovations, more cards will be shuffled in, so on and so forth. Then in the future, whenever you want to innovate and spend an endeavor to do so, then you can draw two cards and choose the uh, innovation that you want to make. So I, in this case, I could choose family or bed. And they all have their own different upsides and downsides, and they will all add more cards into the innovation deck for later. So it's like a tech tree that you're building as you go. Once you have done all that you can possibly do, you've gotten all the gear that you want, you've turned in your resources, you've archived what you want, you will finish up, it's described here, prepare the departing survivors, uh, archive whatever you need to archive, and then end the settlement phase. And what does that mean? back to the hunt. You get together four survivors, whoever is still alive and wants to go out, and get them ready for another hunt phase, showdown phase, and then another settlement phase. You're going to do this at least 25 times. The game is supposed to take place over 25 lantern years, in which case you have a final showdown, which I am not going to go into details on. Potentially, the game can last longer than that because of some story events, but usually it is 25 Lantern Years, and I wish you the best of luck in getting to that point because this game is brutal. That is just scratching the surface of this game, I assure you, but hopefully you got a good taste of what the game is like. Let's get to my final thoughts. Now, I know this has already gone long enough, but I want to give another disclaimer, and that is that certainly there is something that a lot of people call the Kickstarter effect, which is that... When you kickstart a game, especially for a large amount of money, and I did, you are more likely to be forgiving of that game, to make apologies for it. That if it is bad, if it has rough spots to it, you'll just explain those in the way and say, oh, no, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I, I see this all the time. You go on kicks on a board game geek, you see a lot of people rate a game a 10 before it's even released because they backed it on Kickstarter. Even when the game comes out, they still apologize for it and say, oh, but it's got great components or this and that is fine, it's fine, and they never change their rating. It's a very frustrating thing about some games that are released on Kickstarter, and certainly it is a thing. And I will say that in the past, in the early days of my Kickstarter usage, that certainly happened to me. And of any game that you would think this would happen to me for, it would be Kingdom Death because of how obsessed I've been about it, how much money I put into it, how much I just wanted this game to be amazing. However, it has been almost three years, and in that intervening time, I have been disappointed by a lot of Kickstarters. I have become more realistic and cynical as I have played more and more and more games. And not just Kickstarter games, published games that have really let me down and disappointed me. So, to the point, as time has gone on and I've been seeing very sporadic updates and wondering when the game would come out... I was becoming increasingly skeptical about it. I knew that the miniatures would be incredible, but I also thought maybe that's all there is to the game. There was never any official rulebook release. There was very few scant details. I thought, okay, I just pledged a lot of money for some very nice miniatures and probably a train wreck of a game. That's what I thought. I resigned myself to that. I really did. Here's the truth of the matter finally got the game i've played it quite a bit it is amazing it really and truly is one of the most amazing games i have ever played it has been play tested it has been balanced it has been explored and thought out and conceived in a way i can't imagine the scope of this project and this is just the core game that i'm covering there is so much more to come so many expansions that have been planned Full-on expansions adding more and more and more content to the game. Whole other games are being conceived and thought of, and I can't even imagine it because of how much content is in this one game. I barely know where to start. Let's talk about the components because that's easy. The game is amazing looking. The physical components, the, the miniatures, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. They're exquisite. They're incredibly detailed. They're beautiful. 
the monsters are incredibly grotesque, but even in their... I mean, the whole game could be described as this, but even in their grotesquity, I just made that word up, uh, <laughs> there's a beauty to it. Um, I mean, I've heard people who are way more, like, into miniatures than I am, like the Beasts of War guys, say that they looked at the miniatures like the Phoenix and said, we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen a mass-produced miniature that looks anywhere near as good as this. As far as I'm concerned, from what few Games Workshop miniatures I've seen, these blow them out of the water. Now, the downside to that is that they all have to be assembled, and they're all a big pain in the ass. I will say that up front. The good news, though, is that you can do a little at a time. At the beginning of the game, four survivors, lion miniature, good to go. You actually might get like three lantern ears out of that if you put off some things. And then it's like, okay, make the antelope. Okay, make the, uh, the maybe like, well, I don't even want to say the other things. But you know what I mean. You'll, you'll just slowly build some things. It becomes less daunting. You don't have to delve into the armor kits if you don't need to. I didn't even talk about that. But there is that if you are into hobby miniatures and they look fantastic. Uh, the rest of the bits of the game. I love the artwork in this game. The artwork is so beautiful. Even when it is horrifying. Even when it is truly the most grotesque stuff ever. It's still so well done. And it's so chilling and haunting. This is a survival horror game. And that is what it's supposed to bring out of people. So I really appreciate that. The the bits and the tokens and the board and the box. Everything looks great. The insert leaves a lot to be desired. Not that it's not great and can't hold everything, but you can't like set the board in there. It crushes the cards that divide things. So they didn't put a lot of thought into that. You basically have to resign yourself to having multiple boxes for this game. A box for the miniatures, a box for the boards, things like that. So that's kind of frustrating. But other than that, it looks amazing as far as all the components and presentation. Uh, and also, by the way, a lot of people were like, I'm not back in this game. This game looks terrible. It's probably awful because it has all these sexy pinup model girls, which is so juvenile. That was purely add-ons for the campaign to make more money. Those are not in the box. There is some nudity and stuff in like the imagery of the game. But at t- some of it is just purely artistic. Some of it is so horrifying that it is not titillating at all. So... I would say that there's nothing that you may fear as far as like pinup models in this game. Those are extra things that have nothing to do with the core game. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Moving on to the gameplay. How this game is set up is fascinating. You hunt, you have the showdown, you go to the settlement phase. But every one of those games is a fully fleshed out game. The hunting phase, I was not prepared for how cool that was. I was not prepared for, like, actually going on a hunt, going through these different events, having to find your quarry, having to, like, work together and, you know, make important decisions about trying to find him, hoping you're not ambushed, hoping that you can ambush him, deciding how far out you want to go and how what level you want to fight. That is a fully fleshed out part of the game, and it is super interesting and cool. I thought that that would just be a throwaway thing, but... Each phase of these three phases is fully fleshed out, and that is amazing. The showdown phase is probably the phase I like the least, actually, only because it is D&D-style combat like I have seen a million times before. But now, yes, there is that really cool AI deck and hit location deck, which is a very cool part of the game in and of itself, but still, for the survivors, at least, it comes down to, I move here, I attack, I move here, I attack, okay, now we're done. All right, flip the card. Okay, so it's a little a little mundane, but still, I do like the concept of ripping through the AI deck. It kind of reminds me of Pathfinder Adventure card game in a sense, where the deck for the monster is their life. Um, and the whole part about how persistent injuries can have effects later on, that is really cool. I just wish that the rest of the combat was a little more innovative, but it's tough to come down too hard on that because... It does work. It is super functional how those systems work, how the characters interact with their gear and how that the affinities it works on. This game is full of mini games and that's another one of them. The affinity system is just super cool and trying to get the full set of armor. I didn't even talk about that very much. Lots and lots of cool stuff just going on with equipping your people and sending them out into danger and how combat works with the accuracy and luck and um, taking damage and um, the... uh, the, the whole thing with insanity and brain is hard to wrap your head around, no pun intended, but it just works very well with all the different hit locations. It's not nearly as complicated as you would think, although it certainly is complicated. Now, the game is incredibly lethal, and of course, the showdown phase is one that's going to become most omnipresent, although 
in any phase of the game, death is at your door. There's something in the game called the rule of death, which is where if there's a conflict in the rules, rule in favor of the monsters, you're probably going to die. And that is present in some way, shape, or form throughout the entire game. This constant overwhelming sense of dread. But especially during the showdown, you may just run in situations where you are just obliterated. There's just nothing much you can do. Now, there is a lot of randomness to this game, but I would say that I was surprised by the amount of luck mitigation to the game because superior tactics will win out at the end of it all. Sometimes you're just going to die. Sometimes the situation is just stacked against you. But where things are more even, where there is a significant chance for you to win, tactics will win out. That is definitely something I have found out over time because I have gotten better at the game over time where things were totally overwhelming at first it just got easier. But I do appreciate that tension of the overwhelming nature of the game because it is a survival horror game at its core. Um, And so that brutality of of, of characters getting decapitated or losing limbs or losing their sanity as time goes on, it just makes sense thematically. And I didn't didn't even talk about that. We'll 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 circle back to that at the end, the theme of the game. Uh, But the settlement phase, let's talk about that because that is the coolest part of the game. Everything everything in all the phases links together. So you hunt, you find a creature, you kill it, you drag it back, you use its resources, right? And the end culmination point, which should be the final thing you do during a lantern year, a session of gameplay, the settlement phase. I love it! I, could, I, I mean, it is a lot of bookkeeping, no doubt. The whole game is to a degree, and especially in the settlement phase. But finding the different innovations or building these innovations, having different choices, deciding with your compatriots uh, which ones to use and which ones to go for and had, adding more, depending on which one you pick, you have to add more innovations to the deck that you may be able to draw later, like a tech tree of a sort. It's so cool. I love that part of it. I love building the different types of structures that will make you get more better gear. And then as you get some structures, you may unlock other structures if you have the right items. Even within the gear list of the possible things you can build for a location, you might have to unlock things later based on different innovations that you get. So it's all linked together. It's like the coolest like crafting system of a video game in board gaming form like I have not seen before. I'm sure other games have done things like that. I mean, physical board games. But this is my first experience and it has done so, so well. Just really enjoyable. And uh, just the, how the crafting works. Again, trying to outfit all of your different characters, using your resources to the best of your ability. It really is, it really brings out the cooperative aspects of the games and makes it shine because you're all working together. It's such desperate straits that you all want to have the best gear. You want to make sure that you get the best innovations. You want to make sure that you just have a good time though. So sometimes you go for innovations that just seem fun or gear that seems fun, even though it's probably gonna lead to your death, but it's you're having such a good time doing it that you kind of ignore that at the time. So that, I mean, I love the settlement phase. It's such a cool aspect of the game, but let's talk about the theme. Let's circle back to that because the theme is also tied in directly with the mechanisms of the game. The storyline events, not just the settlement events that you get automatically when you come back to the settlement after a hunt and a showdown, not just the things that click off when you go to lantern years, but when characters age, storyline event. When characters get courage and understanding, storyline events. When they get weapon proficiencies. When you go on the hunt, I mean, when different things and landmarks or, or, or milestones are hit. And so many different things can trigger these story events. And you might think, well, that's a cop-out, right? I mean, you're really just reading out of a book. Well, that's so cheap but it is an integral part of the game and the development of the game and how each storyline event resolves. And I wish I could tell you about them, but I don't want to ruin it for you. But how those events resolve and go in different paths will lead each settlement to being very, very different than the others. You'll focus on different things. You might focus on different areas of the game based on what happens to your individual survivors and whether they march off into the darkness to their deaths or they become super powerful or they become leaders of your community. There's so many cool thematic elements to the game. So it's like this survival horror, but with life springing eternal or trying to and like building up this this community. There's this like deep sense of community that you and the other players get as you build up your settlement and there's intimacy and you 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 birth children and then your survivors get into relationships with one another and you care about it and you like 
you feel badly when they die, but even knowing that you're going to see a lot of them die. So it has like this overwhelming sense of dread and despair, but you have to keep going forward. There's a line in the beginning of the book, something like, uh, like the mission statement of the game, which is like to show the, the fragility of human life, but also the triumph of the human spirit, which sounds really cheesy to say it like that, but that is what this game is. It is brutality. It is darkness. It is triumphing over all of those different things. It is innovation. I mean, the game as a whole is innovation. I mean, this is like nothing I have played before. Do I recommend this game for everyone? Absolutely not. Here's where I'll come back down to reality a bit. This game, first off, incredibly fiddly. It just is by its very nature. You are constantly flipping between different cards. You are flipping over boards. You are switching between different phases. You are uh, writing down on sheets of paper. You are looking for cards desperately in the box and like, which cards are those? Wait a minute, this deck or this deck? And then you're flipping over settlement events. You're flipping through the book saying, what what event is that? Okay, let me get to that. Okay, now I'm going to read here. Now you got to roll this die and then we'll see what happens. Oh, you rolled that. So here on this table. Oh, okay. So if that happens, then we go to this table. The game is full of stuff like that, and people are going to be driven nuts by that. I know there are people in my group who will not like that type of thing, and I know there's a lot of people out there who are watching who are going to be like, I'm out. I don't want to do that type of stuff. It's the type of stuff that role-playing gamers are totally used to, not necessarily board gamers. Role-playing gamers probably would gravitate towards this game the most, but I don't think exclusively. I think that board gamers who love a thematic, rich Ameritrash experience, but want even more than that, would gravitate towards this as well, role-playing game experience or not. Other faults of the game, it is very difficult. It is very long. It is a commitment of time and effort. You have to assemble those miniatures. That's a pain in and of itself. Painting them or not, it's just a tremendous amount of work to put the game together and get it going. And it does have incredibly dark themes. Now, I appreciate that because I don't, I'm tired of generic fantasy. I love fantasy as a broad genre, but I want some edge and some bite to it. And that's what Kingdom Death delivers more than anything else. That's a guaranteed thing I knew would come out of the box, and I'm not disappointed by it at all. In fact, it went beyond my expectations of horror and savagery and just, uh, but beautiful fantasy at the same time. I really appreciate all that different stuff. Maybe the thing I need to mention the most here is that the game is incredibly expensive. Even the core game right now, at the time of publishing this video, there is a temporary, I don't know how temporary, it seems to be going on for weeks, but you can get in on a set of pre-orders that are for $295. That's $295 just for the core game. And while there is a ton of content and high quality miniatures that come with that $295, it's still a lot of money. And I've had the same discussion about Cthulhu Wars, which I thought was a good game, but not necessarily worth the money for me, because I have Chaos in the Old World, which fits the same role at a much cheaper price. And Dawn, Rise of the Oculites, good game, extremely expensive, almost as much as Kingdom Death, and maybe there were other miniatures games that did what that game did better. I will say, I have no other game in mind that I have ever played or can even think of, that I would want to play, that does what Kingdom Death does. Which sounds funny to say. But Descent gets some of the things right. Um, Maybe a role-playing game could mimic a lot of this stuff in a much more abstracted form, of course, of actually role-playing. But all these different things together, with solid board gaming mechanisms and the miniatures, there's nothing else like it. It just doesn't exist, okay? So I'm not telling you to drop all of your money on this game. Because, again, it is going to apply to a select group of people. Um, There's some people that are just not going to like this game. There's some people who are going to be disappointed by this game because of how fiddly it is, because of the very nature and the brutality and how difficult the game is and how it constantly feels like you're shoveling shit against the tide at times. Um, It will be for a select group of people. I don't know that this game will ever have mass market appeal, which, while sad is understandable by the nature of it. But I will say this, if you've had this nagging thought in your mind, you keep seeing people talk about it, and you're just wondering, hoping that it is right for you, if you are intrigued by what you saw in my video or other people's videos, you might want to look into it. And you might want to give it a shot if you know anyone else that has it, or if you can go to a convention and try it out. I have to tell you, I am incredibly happy 
with the amount of money I spent on it. I'm incredibly happy with this game. It is fascinating. It is wonderful. It is top 100 material for sure. Possibly top 10 material for sure. We'll see where time takes it. But I have loved it so far. And even as I did the overview, I'm like, I wish I could stop this overview and play it some more. Because it is an incredible, one-of-a-kind experience. That is Kingdom Death Monster from designer Adam Poots. I can't recommend it enough. While at the same time, knowing that it's tough to recommend it. But please give it a shot if you can. 